Good morning, everyone. I, I'm Bob Green. Uh, I'm a professor now at the University of Kent um, and um, uh, a fellow Yorkshireman, a fellow person from, from Yorkshire. I've just met Sarah, one of your students from Sheffield, which is my hometown. Um, so I had two options this morning when I sort of first saw the, the sort of high scientific content of the, uh, the first talks. I thought, mm, actually, you know, shall I give you something on next generation or whole generation sequencing, um, uh, whole genome sequencing? Uh, my background really is from the Forensic Science Service um, and then on to, to the Home Office um, and really was, became the, the head of science and technology uh, in a branch of the Home Office. Uh, so not too bad really for the, uh, for the Sheffield lad I guess. Uh, but I sort of thought well I, I showed it to James and he seemed to think that this my, my sort of first option would have been, uh, would have been good. So if at any point you starts it to wane off we can actually go and have a little bit of whole genome sequencing if, if you'd prefer that uh, but this really is a um, a bit of a, a practical aspect of um, forensic science practical applications of forensic science which of course has been my my background uh, for the years before you were even uh, you were even born uh, my career in forensic science started off around about 19 or 1979 I guess um, so to many of you that's the middle ages you know so this is not a history lesson but that's really where i, I started so i've really seen this um you know this, this progress of um of, of primarily of, of dna technology starting in the, the late 80s the mid to late 80s uh, and before that fingerprint so i thought uh, i'd talk about the two primary identifiers uh, used in forensic science and, and just the, the the power of those um, identifiers to actually identify uh, criminals to exonerate the, the innocent I think that's often a, a th something that, that gets lost in the in the print so does that sound like a deal or would you prefer to do whole genome sequencing good okay you want to do this okay um, so we'll talk about the two primary identifiers uh, and I'll try to make well it, it is quite interactive so you'll get a chance to ask questions you'll get a chance to sort of see why uh, eyewitness testimony is rubbish uh, and why we actually need the power of science why we actually need you people uh, to ident properly identify these people um, and you know I, I've had the privilege really of, of traveling around lots of countries worldwide and when you see countries that have no science and, and how people are you know how, how prosecutions are taken forward um, you sort of think mm, this is really really scary um, so I'm looking to you um, guys to, to sort of take the, 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 the mantle forward um, and I'll start by saying that why, uh, why, it, why is science needed? Uh, because there are only three ways in which you can ever solve crime or you can ever exonerate the, the, uh, the innocent. Um, and that's by, the, by these three, hello, um, these three things here. The, we've got eyewitness testimony, which I'm going to come on to in a moment. Uh, we've got a little bit of an interactive on eyewitness testimony. Uh, we've got confession evidence, uh, and we've all heard horror stories, haven't we, about confession evidence uh, and some of the countries I've been to and seen how these confessions are obtained you sort of think wow um, you know we, we really do need to, uh, uh, to, to hone upon that, that sort of third element of, of science because of course science is advancing all the time um, if you'd have said to me when I was uh, the lad in Sheffield uh, all those years ago if you'd have ever said to me Bob you know we'll, we'll be able to recover DNA from things like a house brick uh, and we'll be able to put it onto a database and it will tell us who uh, who this person is and it will exonerate the person who's probably been wrongly accused uh, I'd have said actually that's science fiction um, I'd have said it's, it, that's just nonsense you know we can't do anything like that. if you'd have said to me Bob do you know that anything really nowadays that touches your skin any spectacles uh, any, any any garment that really anything that really touches your skin has the potential to leave DNA uh, once again I would have said that that's uh, you know, science fiction so you guys really are the future um, in terms of taking this forward. So let me start off by doing you this little interactive, I guess. Uh, it's just a little bit of fun, but it, it really probes why um, we don't see what we think we see. Um, why are all of these, many of these cases taken forward on eyewitness testimony uh, when, when it's uh, proven to be uh, very fallible. So you all bright people, you've all got the, uh, you've all got the instructions, yes? Um, and I'm going to take away one card and we're going to ask was it your card that disappeared it was but is there anything else did anything else happen 
most people get the card disappeared. Um, and for years, it took me to, to actually get why, why it disappears. Does anyone, has anyone spotted why, why your card disappeared? Because they all changed very slightly. Um, so it works every time. It's a little bit like one of those tricks in the fairground where you, you'll never win because actually it's, it, it's fixed. Um, so it just goes to show, really, doesn't it, that you know that we, we really, if we've got these three elements of, comp, you know, being able to detect crime and exonerate people, we've got science, we've got confession evidence, uh, we've got eyewitness testimony. Are you beginning to get a sense now? And I, I appreciate I'm biased, but are you getting a sense that? Actually, you know, science is, is key. Science is the winner in this. So let's do another, just a little icebreaker, really. Um, this is, uh, again, proving, probing the, the, the fallibility of, of eyewitness testimony. Uh, imagine for a minute you, that you're in the petrol station, we're in a petrol station buying milk. Of course, nowadays we can't afford to buy petrol, but in the days when we, uh, we could, we would go to the petrol station and we'd buy, uh, uh, buy petrol. So, this is it's a little bit false because in, in reality um, you wouldn't actually have this preamble you know these these things would just happen um, and you uh, you know you, you, would, you would get all of this these instructions um, so this is what happens uh, and um, you get a, a fleeting glance of uh, an individual um, that was him that's all you're going to get um, and then sometime afterwards you're asked to go on an identi identity parade. Now in the old days, in the good old, day, good old bad old days, there were physical lineups. Um, you know, I can still remember to the day, you know, going around, they call them stooges. We were sent around finding stooges and uh, people who looked like the, uh, uh, you know, the, the offender. Nowadays they're actually done electronically. So you're going to have to now, um, in question two, Tell me which one you think, um, which one it was. And the point I always make here is remember, guys, because if, if you ever look, if you ever Google the Innocence Project in the USA, it is a US um, website, but if you look at, um, look at that, you'll realize just how many people are falsely identified with eyewitness testimony. Uh, and people who've gone to prison for long periods of time. Even worse, some people who've been, been executed um, on testimony that's, that's actually you know, proven not to be correct. So who wants to be brave and have a shout out? Who thinks, uh, yeah? I think it's number two. Does everyone agree? Okay, good, I think it's number two. So we can, send, we can safely then send this guy to prison um, and uh, uh, for, for the, I guess for the rest of his life or however much it works here, but whatever. So are you beginning now to see the value of, of science? Um, and, and certainly, in going back to my later years when I worked in the, in the Home Office, um, part of my role was actually to look at the, uh, not to check them of course, but to actually look at the number of, of DNA and fingerprint matches that would come across my desk uh, every week. Bearing in mind every week we're talking about now. Um, and I would get around about 840 uh, fingerprint matches. I'd get around about around about the same 840, 850 DNA matches. And within that, those matches, were, there was always murders, uh, sexual offences, uh, just the power of, of, the, of science. You've actually no idea really just how much uh, the power is. Uh, so that's really what I thought I'd use as the theme for, uh, for, for today's talk. Um, and already now you can see uh, that uh, this Elizabeth Loftus is one of the, uh, the primary authors on the fallibility of um, eyewitness testimony. Anyone read any of, any of Elizabeth Loftus's work? Um, she's written extensively on do we see what we think we see. Um, so once again, if we've got confession evidence, uh, which is sometimes extracted you know, with a, a rubber truncheon, um, we've got the fallibility of eyewitness testimony. What are we left with, guys? Science. So are you convinced? Can I say you're convinced or, or not? If it's not, we go on to do a slot on whole genome sequencing. So uh, it's your choice. All right. So let's now take a, a, a sort of map through really uh, some of my career. Um, I was around forensic science when, when this happened. Um, and some of you might have actually spotted this, seen this very first famous, famous case, the first one worldwide. It was a murder of Linda Mann uh, and, uh, and another uh, young, young girl, Dawn, Dawn Ashworth. Um, 
they were attacked and murdered and in back in 1986 um, DNA samples were, were found on the, the girl's body and prior to that of course we, you know all we had was the, the standard serology tests have you, have you done anything about serology uh, you know the ABO PGM groups that type of thing that's all we had so we, which of course were, were no good for for inclusion uh, and he was the very first person to be convicted um, for murder using DNA uh, there's a long long story behind it but he, he was ultimately convicted of, of DNA and in fact now he's served his sentence and would you believe he, he's out and uh, out on parole um, so he's back out with his, his Colin Pitchfork he came out on, on license initially uh, very quickly breached the terms of his license uh, was sent back to prison uh, and is now being given a second or third chance to come out and, and re-offend, I suppose. But there again, I'm, I'm a little bit biased, I guess. So that was a very f that's, that was a first for us, um, and that was put together really by a, a guy called Professor Sir Alec Jeffries. You've probably read about him, um, who was the uh, the, uh, the forefather, I suppose, of forensic DNA. He didn't invent DNA. That, that was, of course, was many many people took took part in that. Francis Crick. Um, Maurice Wilkins, uh, um, Rosalind Franklin. I, I, I will never forget Rosalind Franklin because I think she got a, a, a bum deal actually when uh, um, at the time. So Rosalind Franklin was was very much key to, to that to that story as well. So all of the uh, the girls in the in the room, um, you know, follow Rosalind's uh, example. Um, but there were there were others who came before. Um, and that was the, that was the first. Um, you've probably all done some of this at school. You you do some DNA studies at school, yeah? Yes or, or no? Everyone looks so so scary, so scared. You do 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 any. So you, you know then that that it's double helix. One side goes one way, one side goes the other way. Uh, you know that uh, one side goes up five to three, the other side comes down three to five. You know that it's joined together by uh, by uh, nucleotides. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> okay, <laughs> right, <laughs> that was different. Um, so that, um, and, and again, I think we, we, we take our hats off really to people like um, Maurice Wilkins. Uh, Crick, Watson, uh, and others, and of course we came to this. The, the forensic team, the forensic world, came to this uh, much later on in '87. So lots of this research was being done, um, and again, just the power of you know the, this molecule. I, I'm always amazed. I'm, that, that's amazing. I actually, have one of these molecules on my, my desk, uh, a full, almost a full size, well, a large size mo molecule. Uh, I suppose I ought to get out a little bit, didn't I? Uh, it shows my uh, interest. So in forensic DNA, in mainstream forensic DNA now, we use um, uh, nucleic DNA, so it's the DNA that's recovered from the nucleus of the cell. Um, there are other types of DNA that we use, we use mitochondrial DNA, which of course is maternally inherited. Uh, I was in the forensic science service when we, we, we did some work on the Tsar's bones, the, the Romanov family, who were murdered all those years ago, finding out whether or not who, who they were related to. Um, so, primarily we use, uh, m uh, we use uh, nucleic DNA uh, and of course that comes from, from the cell, from the nucleus uh, and effectively we target positions on the chromosome. We target positions which are referred to as polymorphic, that means there's as much variation. Uh, and the next generation now of, of this polymorphism is what's been referred to as next generation sequencing or whole generation sequencing where we can actually look even deeper and look at those more polymorphisms within the, the repeating sequences of STRs. Uh, yeah, we can look even deeper. So the good thing with forensic science is where there's difference, where there's variation, uh, it's very often uh, a good start for us to, uh, um, to develop good evidence. Um, this is how we do it, and I'm guessing that some of you will have done these experiments in, in school, I guess. Uh, you might have certainly have extracted some DNA, I guess. Uh, do you still use strawberry or uh, strawberry? Good old strawberries. Any, any, think, any advance on strawberries? Did you? Onion? Anyone done onion or? 
you know, strawberry is the, is the classic. Uh, and of course, you all know then that we, we just wash the DNA out, don't we? Primarily, it's, it's just washed out of the, uh, the background. And, and this is effectively the, the same technique that we do in, uh, in forensic science. We, uh, we recover the DNA from uh, in, in, in smaller and smaller amounts. So in my day, when we started, we, we had to start with a piece of DNA like so. Um, nowadays, we, we start with 500 picograms, yeah? Half a nanogram of material is the, the standard starting material for, uh, uh, for, for DNA. So it's much, much uh, advanced in terms of sensitivity, which has given us some great advances in one respect. In others, it's posed some challenges, but we'll talk through some of these. Uh, later on. So we would get the blood sample very much as they did in the, the pitchfork era. Uh, we'd get the, the, the DNA from the um, white blood cells. Anyone want to ask me why we get only, only from the white blood cells? Because we're looking at the nucleus, aren't we? Uh, and it's only the, the white blood cells that actually have a nucleus. So the, the good part of the, the proportion of the, the blood is, uh, is not used. We've then got to uh, uh, effectively cut it into, into segments. We use restriction enzymes to, to do that, effectively mo molecular scissors. Um, and we've then got to separate the, um, the mount by, by size. Uh, DNA, of course, you know is, is negatively charged, um, so it will be drawn towards the, the positive end of the, uh, the gel plate. Uh, and then if you look at any images of uh, the, the time of pitchfork, you'll see Alec Jeffries holding up this uh, autoradiograph the, these traditional barcodes, they're actually not used nowadays, uh, but the technique is, is very, very similar. It's that separation technique. So, I was told that this might freeze, so. So you've all, or most of you have done that. Um, you may not have done this because that, that next step uh, back in 1983, that next, that next advance was by Terry Mullis, um, who exploited the, uh, the way in which the, the DNA will, will separate uh, depending upon the, the temperature. Uh, again, you, you might have done some of these experiments at school, but effectively we extend the, uh, um, the, the, the length of the, uh, the DNA strand. So you can see when we um, increase the uh, um, the temperature, um, we get the denaturation stage, uh, the DNA falls apart. Um, and effectively, if you sort of think of it like a, you know, just putting the DNA on the, on the, stu on the cooker uh, and heating up the, the cooker and it put the heat on, it, it separates. Uh, turn the heat off, it will rejoin. And during that process, if you put some uh, additional uh, primers into it, they will, they will bind in, in, in certain locations and will effectively duplicate the, the length of that, uh, that molecule. And we do that, we did that in my day 28 times, so the standard test was 28 times. Nowadays it's 31, 31 cycles. So of course we, we not only are we collecting much smaller amounts of DNA, uh, but we're growing up uh, this, uh, like, like a, a molecular photocopier. So it's instead of turning 28 times, we do it to 32. So that's how PCR works. Uh, and good old Kerry Mullis back in 1983 was the, the brainchild behind that. Then uh, we've got the job of separating out, separating it out because it's all, it's all jumbled up. Any of you been to uh, ASDA and sort of wanted to, your change to be sorted into, uh, you know, you've got pockets full of change and you sort of throw it into that uh, machine, don't you? And it sorts it out and it tells you how much you've got minus something. But uh, that's the idea with, with this. It, it's separating out the DNA by molecular weight. Um, the large bits of DNA will go through the gel uh, slower than the, uh, the, the, smaller, the, the smaller parts. Uh, and that's really what it looks like in, in a little animation. Have you done any of this at school? Did you do any of this at school? Okay. Well, you should come to, to Kent then, and we'll, we'll have a little experiment at Kent uh, showing you how, this, uh, how you could do this. We, this is common practice. It, it's not common forensic practice because uh, we, we don't use gels anymore. Uh, but that's how it's, how it's done in, in, in most research labs, es essentially. Um, a little jelly, a gel plate with almost like jelly you, type, you get it to a, 
uh, you know, for, for, for your birthday. So it's positive end. Um, it's being drawn up toward the positive, from the negative to the positive. The, um, the larger fragments will go last. Um, the, bigger fra the smaller fragments will go first. Uh, and it will separate them out by, by size. So just thinking about that, you know, that, that coin sorter, all your little coins are going up to this end, all the big coins. Uh, what's the biggest coin now? Is it two pounds? I don't know. I don't ever don't get uh, two pound coins, but uh, that, that type of thing. And it, essentially then what we're left with is rather nowadays we, we're left with this uh, electrophorogram. Um, this is a, a, a modern EPG. Um, and you can probably see the, uh, the, the, the grey bars on the top. Um, they're the positions on the chromosome where we target um, our, you know, our, our sequencing. So there, those, those are the areas where we know that there's lots of variation uh, across, the, uh, across the country. Um, D13 is effectively on chromosome 13. Uh, D16, of course, chromosome 16. Um, and <coughs> the AML, the X and the Y, uh, is this test at the bottom. Um, we've, where we've got two peaks, we've got um, a, 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 a male individual. And once it's all finished, once all the, the great science has been done to get us to, to this point, um, that's what we're left with. Uh, we're left with a series of peaks. It goes on now to, to 17 of these uh, peaks, um, but you can see that uh, we have the, they sort of match. Do you think that that is a, is a match? Would, would you say that that's a match? Well, yes, it is, uh, although it, it does bring out a, an interesting point because when we started um, back in, uh, in 1995 with the DNA database, we went live with uh, what we would refer to as a sixplex. Uh, it was called second generation multiplex, uh, and it had six sites. So this has one, two, three, one, two, this has four. So this would be called a quad. We, we actually did experiment with, with quad. Uh, but the problem with this is that it's not discriminating enough. Um, we need these extra sites. So over the years, we've actually built, we've built extra sites onto, onto the end, on, actually onto both ends. So we get the, the higher molecular weights and the lower molecular weights. Um, and the, you get that sequence. Uh, but there is a possibility that just walking up the high street in Canterbury, uh, that I might bump into someone who is a a 13 and a 16 at the 8. Just by chance, there might be someone in the room who's a 13 and a 16. Um, so th there isn't enough discriminating power in those, uh, those tests. As the size of your database grows, statistically, you, you have to put more markers in to give you that discrimination. So that's what we did uh, after finding some, well, getting, getting into some problems really with uh, you know, people who very clearly weren't able to commit these crimes, being identified with these uh, you know, the, these sixplex uh, systems. Anyone want to mention anything about the, uh, the high peak at uh, chromosome 7, D7? Anyone want to, what, what would you say about that? Why is there just one peak at, um, at, at uh, chromosome 7? Remember guys, we, we inherit, don't we, one peak from either um, parent. Sometimes we, we inherit um, the same peak from both, pe both parents. So this is what's referred to as a heterozygous peak. You can see that it's a lot, lot taller. Um, and the reason it's a lot taller is because you're getting double the amount of DNA. You're getting mum's DNA and dad's DNA in that single peak. Um, we did do some work over the years with, um, with some royal families. Uh, and there's some interesting profiles that are developed where, where you, don't, you don't get that sort of randomness of, uh, of, of, uh, of DNA split. So that would be a match with those, all those caveats that it, it's only a, uh, you know, perhaps a partial match. So that was a quick run through uh, of DNA. Is it okay so far or do you want to go into next generation sequencing? Uh, okay, I've got some smiles. So, so let's go back to 1902, which even I don't remember 1902. Um, I'm not even that old. So 1902 was the, the significance of that date um, was that it was the date of the first, very first conviction uh, of a guy in London. Um, I can't recall his name now, but he was, he was convicted on fingerprint evidence in 1902. 
Uh, he'd stolen some, some billiard balls, like snooker balls, um, and his fingerprints were found actually on those, uh, those snooker balls. And the other thing, and, and I'm sure this crosses over also into, um, into other aspects of um, science and studies, um, is that we always start off by looking, trying to classify the, uh, the materials into what, what we refer to as class evidence. Um, so, for example, these are archers, uh, and if you want to look at your, your fingers, you will see that around about 5% of the class will have this arch pattern. Um, it's, can you see how the, the, the line goes just from one side to the other? And it, it, it forms a peak in the, uh, uh, in the top. It doesn't turn backwards, and these are the, the primary classifications. So the, the point I'm making there is that it's pointless trying to match a, a, an arch pattern um, with this type of pattern, isn't it? This loop pattern. This is a loop that, can you see, that, that turns round back on itself. Um, it goes um, back. And, and there should be some people in the class who've, who've got far more, they, they should be more common. Um, has anyone got, got loops? Everyone got loops? They should, six out of ten of you should have loops. Uh, and then there's this whirly type pattern. Um, and once, once again, it, it's just like try, me trying to compare a Dr. Martin shoe uh, with a, a training shoe, Nike shoe, or whatever, whatever it is. Uh, we, we can't, if, we don't, if we get to that point and we're finding these at the, at the, the incident uh, and archers at the, uh, on the individual, we know that we can't go any further. But then there's, there's another level of detail. Within that, that overall pattern is actually made up of um, minutiae. We call it second level detail. Um, and this is what it looks like. Uh, and this is how the identifications are made. Does anyone watch NCIS or C what is it? Uh, uh, those types of programs? Uh, yeah? Uh, CSI, Miami, or whatever. Well, you, you've seen how they do this in seconds, don't they? They do it instantly, instantaneously. Uh, and what, this, what the computer is, the, the computer algorithms are drawing a spatial pattern of all of these minutiae. They're actually starting by looking at, you know, is it, is it a Dr. Martin or is it a trainer? Uh, what's the overall pattern? If we can move then to the next step, then let's have a look at the, uh, the, the second level detail. So just very quickly, um, how much of time? Uh, ten, minutes. 10 minutes, okay, we've got about 10 minutes then to go. Um, just a little bit of fun to, to, to the end. Um, Fictitious case um, showing really that the advances in, in fingerprint technology, because we went, when I started, we were very much you know, doing this by eye. Nowadays, we do it by, by computer, but we do it very quickly. This was a case, a fictitious case, back in, in London, uh, and you can see what, what happened there. And that was the evidence. And we, we've got lots of different types of evidence. We can look at cigarette butts. We, we could get very easily now DNA profiles from cigarette butts bloody towels, newspapers and so forth. So if we had more time, we could dig into those far, far deeper. But that's just an example of what those evidence types were. So once again, with the advances in science, uh, back in round about 89, we started with the, the first uh, computerized databases um, and we were able to revolutionize fingerprint evidence. Uh, any of you ever tried those we used to get them as kids for, for Christmas, dot to dot books, where you actually drew a, a line between the, the numbers. Uh, it, it's essentially that type of thing. And, and when you finished it, it draws you an elephant or a giraffe or something. And then you fire off all the giraffes to the, the database, uh, and it tells you which ones match. So you all got the, uh, you all got the gist. Can you all see the, the instructions? Yeah? Are you going to get a sense, guys, that how, how probative this might be uh, and how it's much, much better than eyewitness testimony? how it's much better than certainly the rubber truncheon uh, that I've seen over the years in my, uh, in my experience. So it, the, this case is reinvested, reinvestigated and you have a choice. Um, the, 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 the computer will generate a number of potential matches. Uh, and remember, and the one thing I always say to my students now is that remember the consequences of this. Remember the consequences of getting this wrong. You know, if you, we get this wrong, uh, if we get, to, like, with, with the eyewitness testimony, you know, someone is going to go to, to jail for, for a long time, in, in fact, worse in some countries. So we've got the option of Delgado, Sand, or Watson. 
uh, and now I'm going to ask you to, uh, to be the investigator. That's the, the partial seat mark, mark you actually get at the scene. Very often it, it is partial, it's, it's smudged. Uh, you only get a little bit of it. Um, so you know, if any of you had, had the mis misfortune of being burgled, you'd probably see the, the fingerprint guys coming around and trying to take these. But they're often not of good quality enough uh, to actually do anything with. So um, that's Delgado. We, we can skip back between these. So I'm going to ask you now to, to make your choice which one it is. We'll go, we'll go back, back and forward. So that's Delgado. That's the, that's, the crime sample. that's the crime scene mark. That little part of the, the overall fingerprint. This is Delgado. And the key here is to actually try to separate this out by, by class. So if it's, a, if it's a Dr. Martin pattern, and we, you know, we, we've got a training shoe pattern on the crime scene mark, uh, we can discount for, first, first of all. So that's Delgado. This is Sand. And this is Watson. I can see some smiles already. I think we've got some budding fingerprint people in the audience. Is anyone leaning towards Watson? Are you leaning towards Watson? Okay. Anyone else leaning towards Watson? Are you leaning towards Watson so that you're sure? Uh, yeah, there, there's, no reason, there's no room for doubt. And remember what we're doing here, guys. We're, we're looking for a small part of, of that crime scene mark in Watson's rolled image. Uh, so we're not actually seeing the whole, the whole image. Are you sure, guys? Are you, are you sure that, you sure it's Watson? No, no, no? okay. Some people, are, I mean, I, I'm rubbish at it. I, I did a, a test once on, on this, and I think I scored about 40%, which is a bare scrape, so I, I'm standing here as the expert, not being very good myself, so uh, who's going to go with Watson? Yeah. Oops, it, it, you are right. Uh, I think it just had showed you the, the mark up there. It was, um, that's the crime scene mark. I'm sorry it's pixelated on this screen. But can you see that the, the mark, this mark, oops, is a small portion of this. So once again, guys, I, I hope that's a bit of interest. I, it's very, been very practical, been very different to what you heard, uh, first of all. Um, but once again, it, it's, it's crucial, you know, be part of that 840 matches per, per week that come, uh, come through the system. So I hope it's been of interest, um, and I think it proves that forensic science is for, uh, or STEM is for the, for, for the good, uh, but forensic science is punches well above its weight. Thank you. Thank you.